Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's program. It's the first of three discussions about the intersection of artistic expression and protest for racial justice. Tonight, we focus on visual art. Later in the series, we look at music and finally written word. My name is Marcia Eli. I'm the director of programs at the Brooklyn Public Library Center for Brooklyn History and a member of the library's arts and culture team, BPL Presents. We're really honored to be partnering in this series with New York University's Brooklyn-based The 370J Project and NYU's Office of Diversity and Strategic Innovation. For us at the Center for Brooklyn History, Tonight is one piece of a multi-pronged public history initiative titled Brooklyn Resists, which explores the long and powerful history of Black-led protest. There's much to say about Brooklyn Resists, but I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. Um, you can learn more about it at the link that is going into the chat. And in a moment, we'll welcome artist Dred Scott, photographer Ruddy Roy, and our series moderator, author Jesse McCarthy. I'm very excited to hear their exchange tonight. But before I turn it over, a few quick notes. First, this program can be experienced with closed captions. You can activate those by clicking the icon at the bottom of your screen. Second, I, I want to mention that we regularly partner with a local independent business, the Community Bookstore. And if you're interested in exploring Jesse's acclaimed book of essays, Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul, we'll place a link in the chat to that page on Community Bookstore's website. And finally, I want to invite all of you to share your questions tonight. Just type them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. It has been an enormous joy to partner with NYU's The 370J Project. And it's my pleasure now to welcome 370J's Michael Bernard. Michael. Thank you, Marcia. Uh, let me start uh, this evening by inviting you all to join me in acknowledging that while we may be gathered together virtually, um, we are physically joining from locations throughout the city and perhaps the country that are on unceded homeland of here in New York, the, the Lenape people and other Native American peoples nationwide. Um, and we pay our respect to these communities, their members past and present, as well as all future generations. New York University, Brooklyn Public Library, and the Center for Brooklyn History acknowledge that we were founded on and beneficiaries of the intentional exclusions, genocide, and erasure of the Lenape. We are committed to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies and repercussions of settler colonialism. This acknowledgement is only the beginning of that effort. So again, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us today to kick off this exciting series of conversations. My name is Michael Bernard, and I'm here representing the 370J Project, which is the programming arm of NYU Brooklyn's Center for Art, Technology, and Innovation, and we're located at 370J Street in downtown Brooklyn. Uh, I would like to extend my thanks again to Marsha and her team at CBH for creating space for tonight's discussion and for assembling this exceptional panel um, I would now like to introduce our distinguished moderator for tonight's discussion. Jesse McCarthy is assistant professor in the Department of English and of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. Among his published works are a new introduction for the Norton Library edition of W.E.B. Du Bois's The Souls of Black Folk and an introduction for a new edition of Vincent O. Carter's The Burn Book. He is the author of, of the collection of essays, Who Will Pay Reparations on My Soul, and the novel, Fugitivities. Jesse, take it away. Right. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thank you also, uh, Marsha, for helping us to organize uh, this event and really this series of events, um, which I'm, I'm really excited about. And I think give us a, an opportunity uh, to do something that I've been very eager to do, which is to have conversations about black art and black politics and protest and the situation of culture um, and politics in our society, especially around questions of race with artists themselves. Um, and, you know, we've thought about this as uh, hopefully uh, a kind of a setup that will be 
um, not only an interview, but in many ways a conversation that I hope will generate many more conversations beyond the virtual one that, that we're having today. Um, and so with that, um, it's really uh, my pleasure and my honor uh, uh, to give introductions to uh, uh, two extraordinary artists um, that have uh, agreed to join me today to have, to kind of kick us off uh, with a conversation around the visual, visual art. Um, and so with us today, we have Ruddy Roy. He's a Jamaican born photographer, Brooklyn based. Uh, he has an extraordinary presence on Instagram. And I'm actually hoping maybe we can put a link to that um, in the chat uh, with a huge following where you can see uh, many of his uh, photographs and works from important series like Black Portraiture or I Can't Breathe or When Living is a Protest, series which have all been the talking point of numerous forums. His photographs uh, have appeared in the New York Times, The New Yorker, Ebony, Vogue, BET, ESPN, and other places. Roy is a part of the Camoingue Black Photographers Collective, and he was featured in the 2014 documentary through a Lens Darkly, Black Photographers and the Emergence of a People, a magnificent documentary um, that you should definitely check out if you haven't had a chance to see it. And joining Ruddy and myself, we also have, I'm tempted to say the notorious, the legendary Dred Scott. He's an interdisciplinary artist who encourages viewers to re-examine the ideals of American society. His work has been exhibited at the Whitney Museum, MoMA PS1, the Walker Art Center, and in galleries and on the street. In 2019, he presented Slave Rebellion Reenactment, a community-engaged project that reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved peoples in US history. It was a, a major event, and it was featured in places like Vanity Fair, the New York Times, even on CNN in interviews with Christian Amanpour. And he's been highlighted on artnet.com as one of the most, or it, ha I should say, has been highlighted uh, by artnet.com as one of the most important artworks of the decade. And so I'm very pleased uh, to be joined by, uh, 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 by both of you gentlemen, and uh, I'm very eager to have this conversation. Well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Jesse. I mean, this is, this is gonna be a great conversation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, listen, you know, I, we have in a way sort of two macro topics in a way, and they're dialectically related, right? We have on the one hand art and we, only, and we have politics. Um, and we have questions of society and protest and also of craft and making. And I thought maybe I, we'd start with sort of the art side of things first. And we'll, we'll, I think we'll find ourselves ping-ponging back and forth um, because in so many ways, these are so deeply interrelated um, in your works, also in, in my work and in my own thinking. And I'm interested to see how that evolves, but especially for the benefit of the folks who are, who are tuning in and, um, and who may not even be, you know, necessarily be familiar with your work. I think it's always great for folks to get a sense of how you actually came to become, you know, an artist. Like, what was it that, you know, got you excited or made you think one day, this is what I want to do. And, and what was the process like that kind of carried you into the, the, kind of transition from that kind of dream maybe, or a kind of personal vision of, of being an artist and what that might mean, and to suddenly finding yourself practicing it, really coming into a place where you're like, okay, I'm really doing this now. I really am <laughs> a, a practicing living artist who can, um, who can make a life making, this, making these things happen. Uh, I don't know which we can sw switch off any any way, but uh, Dred, I, you, I, the 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 algorithm has you in my in my sights right now. <laughs> on okay. my, so if you want to kick us off, and yeah. then hear from Ruddy too. Oh, cool, cool. So I mean, it's sort of a my my being an artist is kind of a confluence of three events um, or three mm -hmm. things. I I mean. I grew up around cameras. My dad, before I was born, mm. my dad was a photographer. And before I was born, he was a professional photographer, mostly a photojournalist, uh, working for the Defender, um, but also mm -hmm. other newspapers and, and publications. And after, you know, by the time he had me, he changed to being like a, just a serious amateur. He changed careers. 
but I grew up around cameras. I, I got crappy Instamatic cameras when I was a little kid. And then when I was 12, they got me an SLR, which, you know, back in the day yeah. before digital was, you know, it was like just an SLR, single lens reflex. And so, you know, I, I really love doing photography. My dad taught me to, you know, work in a dark room and, and mm. stuff, but I still thought I was going to be a scientist of some sort. I went to a, you know, elite private school for the first 12 years of my, uh, you know, school life kind of, um, but I said, I went there for 12 years. I went through there, there for first grade through 11th grade twice. I didn't quite get out of high school. And so MIT and Caltech wasn't going to take me because I was like a high school dropout. And <laughs> so um, I said, well, I'll be a photographer. And when you're 18, you have no idea what that is. But my parents, you know, really kind of loving thing, didn't say, yo, we paid all this money for you to go to this private school. You're going to be a doctor or lawyer. They said, well, all right, you want to be a photographer they talked to anybody they knew that was a photographer. So I got introduced to, you know, uh, fashion photographers, photojournalists, fine art photographers, uh, mm. architectural photographers. And one of them said, hey, go to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And so I ended up there. And then while there, I kind of was becoming an artist. And then I had this artwork, what is the proper way to display a US flag, which we have an image of. So it might, might make sense to bring this up for a second. Um, agree. And, and so, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a photographer, an artist, but then I had this artwork which became the center of national controversy over its use of the American flag. And, you know, I'd grown up in Reagan's America. I'd become a revolutionary. I wanted my art to kind of serve the people. But, you know, it's like if you say, could art change the world? I would have said, yeah, but if I would have qualified it saying, well, I'm a fine artist. People don't really look at fine art, but, you know, it's mm -hmm. like on a good day. You know, mm -hmm. 500 people see it. It's not like I was Public Enemy or, or uh, Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg, where they reach millions. And so I, but I had this artwork that suddenly was denounced by the President of the United States of America. Mm -hmm. It was outlawed by Congress, and people were coming from housing projects to stand in line for an hour to see an, a conceptual artwork by a previously unknown art student and, and actually saying the work was something that was deeply moving for them. And so that sort of set my life on a, a path that if I could sort of reach the people I wanted to reach and trouble the powerful, then I was like, all right, now I know what I can really do with my art. And I've been trying to walk on that path ever since. Yeah, it's, a, it's an extraordinary um, story, really, the way that one kind of work and event, because it's, you know, in some ways it was as you say, it was it, it's an artwork that generated a kind of moment uh, yeah. and, and a lot of momentum and becomes a kind of catalyst that makes a whole uh, a whole career possible. And, and, and in a sense, it's interesting right there, we see kind of a way in which politics actually, even though it's kind of aimed at trying to suppress the art in a strange way, actually gives it a much more extraordinary vitality and allows it to have um, a, a much longer reach probably than those folks even had ever imagined. It was fascinating. It's really interesting, you know, I had known also that um, in, in a way you uh, come from a, a photography background, or at least that was in the in the background in, in your childhood. And uh, uh, Ruddy, this makes me think I have to, I have to ask you, uh, uh, were, th were there a lot of cameras around in, in your childhood? How did you come to photography? Not one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, actually, I came to photography through writing. Um, wow. My mom would sit us around the, whether the dining room or, or the living room mm -hmm. during dinner or after dinner, and she would tell us stories. Mm. And her stories were different from the stories that I came to this country to learn. Mm. Our, our stories in Jamaica, we're very nationalistic. Um, mm. Our heroes look like me. Mm -hmm. Kodjo Nani, Paul Bogle. Mm -hmm. um, all our heroes, and our heroes won. The only hero that did not win in, in our stories was an entanglement between Taki and Kodjo. Mm -hmm. One was evil, one was good, and the good one killed the evil one. <laughs> or there was this other story called Three Finger Jack. Three Finger Jack lost his finger lost lost two fingers in a in a war in a fight for mm -hmm. his freedom mm -hmm. but my stories were nationalistic as i said when i came here all of a sudden this the the the, the architect or the authors of our stories so to, so to speak did not look like me mm -hmm. and so for me the, the stories were different they did not feel like the stories that I learned about in the Republic. Mm -hmm. And I, I call most countries 
in the Caribbean republics. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so it took me a while to get to the space where I became an artist. Before, I mean, I went to college, I went to college to be a writer. I wanted to continue in the vein of being a writer. Um, I thought it was important to, to tell our stories, to write our stories. Mm. And I would always have these contentions with the editors for these magazines or these newspapers that I work for. Mm -hmm. The stories are always edited in Jamaica. And so I realized that if I took a picture back in the days of analog, of SLRs, that it was difficult for you to remove the head of somebody or edit the image. And so I just started to take pictures as opposed to just writing. As you write, I mean, as a writer, I found that on a two by, on a two, by two or two by four, you could always edit out what was the meat, what was the social justice aspect or parts of the, of the story. Because the person that you're writing about advertising the, in the newspaper. Mm. But if I took a picture, it couldn't be as easily edited. And that was my, that was my beginnings into photography. I walked 121 miles going from Montague to Kingston, photographing people that lived on the railroad line mm. as my first story, my first real story. And those images I took, when I came back here in 2001, those are the same images that I took to the Associated Press that got me my first gig mm -hmm. as a photographer. Mm -hmm. And it's where I am today. That's an, ex it's an extraordinary story. I mean, so, and this is really so interesting to me because um, again, I would not necessarily have suspected, right? That actually behind the impulse to be a photographer, there was actually an impulse to be a storyteller, to be a writer. Um, and I think that's, I, I find that very moving and very, very meaningful too, because I do get a strong sense from your work and from your photographs that the, um, you know, some people might think in, in part, right, because of the nature of the gig, right, in, in various respects, that, um, that it's a kind of journalistic practice. But I actually see in it, I mean, of course, it's partly journalistic in a certain sense, right? I mean, that's maybe what frames it. Maybe it appears in a press outlet, this kind of a thing. But I sense behind it, actually, this, this storytelling, this narrative, this kind of literary quality, um, which I think really comes through. And, you know, it's interesting when I was thinking about, um, about some of the, the special qualities of, of your image work, of your photography, you know, it really reminded me of one of, um, one of the other photographers uh, that I really, really always loved and admired, which is um, uh, Jamel Shabazz. And, you know, he's a he's Brooklyn photographer and, and you know, really um, brought a kind of world of, of kind of street photography and in particular you know he has these books a time before crack and and the, uh, of a kind of community world that was in a certain moment being framed very um, harshly through the news through press uh, particularly during sort of uh, the kind of the height of the so-called kind of crack era um, in a very kind of pathologized lens and if I can you know almost quite literally and he provided really not only counter images, but a kind of counter story, I think, to, to, to that whole community. Um, and I remember uh, at one time I, I, I taught briefly at a, at a high school in Brooklyn, in, in Red Hook, you know, where, where Shabazz is from. And I actually used his, his, um, his photo collections as kind of uh, to teach, you know, and to kind of teach photography, to teach, you know, how to read images and stuff. But one of the things that was amazing was people, people started calling up like their aunties and like, you know what I'm saying? Like family, because they were like, oh, no, no, we know these people. And there's, and people were, I mean, almost in tears, you know, they, they really came together around these images. It was really powerful to see uh, and for people to see themselves, um, not just documented, but included in a kind of narrative in this kind of way. And, and I think your work really speaks to that. It's, um, it's really extraordinary. And um, it's really fascinating to hear that there's behind it this, uh, that, you know, you, you actually had the, the idea to be a writer and then became a photographer. Um, and Dread was, came, came out of a, a situation of being a kind of uh, uh, surrounded by photography, uh, might've gone down that path. 
um, but has become what you had, what, 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 I mean, I would call you a conceptual artist, uh, a multimedia, multi genre artist. How do you think about uh, how you define where you're at now? Because it can also change. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I just generally say I'm an artist. You know, some yeah. people say, hey, you're a performance artist. And I'm saying, well, that's, sure. I'm guilty as charged. Some people say you're a conceptual artist. Well, guilty as charged. They say I'm yeah. a printmaker, guilty as charged, photographer, yeah. guilty as charged. I just work in a lot of different media because I, I try and find like what's the best way to talk about what I want to talk about. And, you know, so, you know, the, 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 I mean, it was, it was really interesting, this question of storytelling and what's not told and, and who's imaged. I mean, when, when Ruddy was talking about, you know, the heroes in Jamaica, including, you know, uh, Nani, Queen Nanny, and for people listening, they may not know, Queen Nanny was a, a, a leader of, of a maroon colony. She was like, you know, and, and doing raids on enslavers in Jamaica and helping to liberate people, but had a whole alternate society and Taki and, and Cujo. Um, I mean, there's a lot of debate about who they were and what they represented, but they were basically, they were leaders of slave rebellions. And actually there's a really good book that's just come out called Taki's Revolt, but actually you're at Harvard by, by yeah, your colleague. Right. I was uh, about yeah, to plug yeah. it, but you beat me to it. <laughs> yeah, no, man, it's a great book. It's really, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's called Taki's Revolt by Vincent Brown and it's, it's really off the hook. And, and so this, this thing of but this question of storytelling and, and what's the story. So when I was doing slave rebellion reenactment, I was doing it in part because there was this buried history that people, you know, it was a weight on people in a weird way, because a lot of people I was talking with more through the course of this, like thought of themselves as descendants of slaves, not the descendants of freedom fighters who happened to be enslaved. And the whole history of America was a history of slavery, not the history of slavery and resistance to enslavement. Mm -hmm. And so putting a question of slave rebellion at the heart of America and the rebel leaders then of the most radical vision of freedom, though that's a story that's really important. And so having Black people envision ourselves both as a, a sort of in, in terms of a broader Atlantic diasporic context, but also as, as have the people that were fighting for freedom and emancipation and a radical vision of liberation. Mm -hmm. And so when Ruddy's talking, you know, there was just this background of imagery of, of our heroes looking like me, that didn't exist when I was growing up in mm -hmm. America. And so the, these stories are powerful. It's really important what story gets told. So I, I think this, question of, you know, I'm an artist, yeah, but it's like, I think a thread that runs through both Ruddy and my work is we're, we're actually shining a light on subjects of people whose often the popular discourse sort of makes us to be the bad people and the people with no history and no future. And so when you were talking about Jamel Shabazz and, and this era of crack, I mean, and, and people say, these are our aunties or cousins, these are our people. And so those, these are the people that often in broader society are not fit for fit subjects for art or for stories. And yet there are all these artists who say, no, we're making these stories. We have to do it ourselves. And it's a different lens and a different perspective. And so I, you know, I think with me, it's like, if I can do that through conceptual art, I will. If I can do it through performance, I will. If I can do it through photography, I will. And it's just, there's sometimes it's better to do one than the other. Yeah. I think that's so true. And, and uh, Ruddy, you, you find one of the things that you do, right, is you find people in a sense sort of where they are. You know, I think of your work as doing so much with kind of, you know, everyday people. Um, but, but the threading together of all of these everyday people allows certain kinds of stories to emerge and, and, and significance. And I'm thinking about, you know, this work that you've been doing on this series, When Living is a Protest. I was wondering if you could um, talk to us a little bit about how you kind of conceptualized um, that project, how you came to it, and, and how it's going to, to the extent that it's still ongoing. Um, truth, the, one of the, the truth is, I got I got really tired of what protest started to become. Mm. Um, it be, became for me performative, and mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm again. I'm not saying that there's not gem in perform performative protest mm. but but 30 40 50 years ago when we protest that was the protest mm. we weren't allowed to protest 50 40 years later you get a, a permit and you're allowed to protest mm -hmm. i started to see where that that was not that that shouldn't be the protest anymore mm -hmm. 
that, that it's an institutionalized protest. It had become commercialized. Commercial. Mm -hmm. um, there's a partner and I, Rebecca Lee Sanchez, we talk about, we talk about monuments and we talk about performance, performance, like, like the protests, the protest no is just walking from here to there, but it has no bite. Um, a monument is takes it down, who erects it? What is the history that we're leaving in that act? Just something as simple as that. And as and again, my work is now informed by this the discussion that she and I are having. And I remember as I moved through, let's say moved through when living is a protest, I started to look at how the mere fact that we're alive, the mere fact that we we ended up moving from slavery to Jim Crow to, mm -hmm. I know I'm going to mess up my history here, reconstruction, mm -hmm. redlining. Mm -hmm. The fact that this guy is here. Now, one of the things that Rebecca and I talk about is fast food culture and mm -hmm. what it is that we're ingesting. What is it? I mean, the whole idea of fast food culture incorporates or envelops a lot of, a lot of things. Um, this for one is fast food culture. The idea that we don't cook anymore, the idea that that uh, a dollar tree in our neighborhood substitutes for real food, like mm -hmm. but legislatively, you, you don't have to put a a, a Kroger or a, a Dave's or a, in in your community anymore as long as you have a dollar tree. Mm -hmm. So what do we get from the dollar tree? What what are we getting through our education? Mm -hmm. um, I did a class. I I, I taught a class three, four days ago, and it was a photography class. We were talking about um, this picture that I had. It's not here where it said, that on the, there's, a, there's a woman wearing a t-shirt that says free at last. We're talking about 15 and 16 year olds who didn't know who made that quote. Mm -hmm. So I said to them, you don't know who, who said free at last, free at, free at last, thank God almighty, we're free at last. They're like, no. I said, who teaches your history? Mm -hmm. As a, I mean, I can send you the video. The woman, the girl in the in the class said, "We are black history. We're taught American history." And I almost lost everything in me. Mm -hmm. Like I had to say to her, "Black history is American history." So for me, when living is a protest, is born out of the idea that we are not in the history books. We're not on TV. We're not in their fashion magazines. We're not on their billboards. And if they put, if, if we're ever there, we're vetted. We're, we're, in a, we're in a space that makes, I remember somebody saying to me, when I first put down my images of black folks, the person looked at me and they said, these are beautiful, Roddy, but can you photograph white folk? Mm. And I didn't, you, you heard that? Mm? Mm. I didn't hear that mm, resound until I went home because the first thing I heard was, why would that person say that? I kept hearing this question over and over and it finally dawned on me maybe months later that they weren't saying to me, you couldn't photograph white folks. They were asking me, could you photograph black folk with a white aesthetic? Could, mm. you, could you whiten this? Could you make your images more palatable to white folk? Mm -hmm. And so with the etymology of what, or the iconography of what black folk imagery has always been, I decided to embark on this idea of photographing black folk in a way that was, that was every day, mm -hmm. that, was, that was relevant, that, that, that was not performative. Like I, I, I don't like to see smiley faces in my imagery. Hmm. Like I want you to meet this person. I want you to meet this person, Roddy Roy, who just came back from, who came from Jamaica. He grew up in a poor household. This is what he went to school. He might be on hard times now, but here you have a little history about who this person is. Hmm. When living is a protest. I hear you saying in part that in a way, and I, I think this is, it's, it's been a long part of really in many ways the black radical tradition in this country is that we're constantly needing to create a counter image and a yeah. counter history. Um, and we're also needing to rework and reappropriate the significance 
of the symbolic imaginary, which includes also the, I mean, because it's heartbreaking what you're saying also, right, about a kind of lack of, of continuity in our own consciousness, right? Where, where kids don't even have, don't even know some, some of the most basic aspects, right, of their own history, even when it's right there on their, on their t-shirt. Um, but, you know, in that, in that picture, um, which we had up just a moment ago um, with the American flag, uh, you know, I wonder if maybe I could have uh, uh, you and Dred talk a little bit about your, the way in which you think about the symbolism of that flag, because both of you, right, I think are, I mean, are obviously very interested in the, the force of that symbol and looking for ways to subvert that force and also translate it or open it up in some ways to unleash different kinds of meanings that it, that it has, but that are not the ones necessarily that we would want to give to it. Um, and I, I was actually thinking also even, <laughs> um, you know, of David Hammond's here, of course, too, and, and, and his American flag. But I wonder, uh, uh, Dredd, if you want to, if you want to hop in here and talk a little bit about um, even how you came to kind of, you know, that extraordinary uh, 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 staging of, of, of your work around the flag and, and how you think about it now. Yeah, I mean, I think this is an important theme. And I, I mean, I actually, I mean, you know, I think it's good to be in dialogue with Ruddy. I mean, I really like, I mean, that image of the guy with the, the you know, box of chicken with the American flag and with his eyes just popped, popped right above the top of the, I mean, it's a beautiful photograph. And this question of using, I mean, you know, this symbol, I mean, the, the question, I think, for a lot of people, and in fact, you know, is what is America and including what is America to black people? And I mean, I a long time ago concluded that this is a country that is oppressive. It's a country that was founded on slavery and genocide. Um, and it is based and ruled by oppression and exploitation and that it has been a disaster for humanity, but including specifically for black people. Now that is not a position that everybody holds, um, but it is something that I think is true. And I think this question of black, I mean, when Ruddy was like, like or when you were both saying, you know, black history is American history, that's absolutely true. The fact that we've been written out of the history when it's, in certain sense, I mean, it's like people, you know, it's like, my grandfather says America, I mean, black people built this damn country. And there's a, there's a certain truth to that, that, I mean, the labor of the enslaved is where the wealth for this country, but I mean, the, even the White House was built by black folk. You know, it was enslaved black people, but it's like, that was black people who did that. And so there's this whole history where, where people get written out of it. But the thing is, there's been this desire. And I mean, I know you've written the, the introduction, recent introduction to the Souls of Black Folks, where Du Bois is wrestling with this. And it st starts off, what does it mean to be a problem? And, and with double consciousness of trying to figure out, you know, for, you're, you're both black and you're an American. And I think that that's, you know, and, and, and he talks about there's this warring, warring within one dark body. And I think that there, there is this real question of, you know, can we be part of this and should we want to? So when I was doing what is the proper way to display a US flag, it was a conceptual artwork. It was an artwork that allowed for audience participation. It had p images of South Korean students burning American flags. It had, um, and holding signs that said, Yankee, go home, son of a bitch. There were flag draped coffins coming back from Vietnam. And it had the text that says, what's the proper way to display a US flag? Below that were books that people could write their responses to that question. And below that was a flag that people had the option of standing on. And that option of standing on is what became, I think, so controversial because it wasn't that I forced people to stand on it. It's that people willingly did it. And then there were all sorts of people writing. Some said they wanted me dead, that I should be shot and, made to, and my family made sure. to pay for the bullets. But there were yeah. also people who said, look, the police killed my brother. And, and they walked over and kicked over his body to quote, make sure the nigger was dead, unquote. That cop was wearing the flag. Thank you for the opportunity to stand on this flag and write these comments. And it's actually not that work. It's the, what's the proper way to display US flag that I was talking about it. So if, if on the screen, you can get the one that has the American flag on the ground. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, um, yeah, that one. So, you know, th this, thing of where people, this question of black people being part of this country, 
there were a lot of people who, you know, felt victimized by America, but those sentiments, like the broader history and contribution of Black people, get written out of the conversation. So allowing people who've been brutalized by the police, who had nightmare stories, say, crossing the border and then being hounded and chased, people who, you know, just, you know, you know tried to work in jobs and like, terrible steel mills or something like that. And then they got closed down and those got, jobs got shipped overseas and they got you know left behind in a certain sense because of the needs and dictates of American imperialism and capitalism. All those people have a different relationship between their, this country and the flag. And so I think that actually using that symbol of talking about this country as a whole, some people still want to be try and make it work, try and figure out, well, look, there, it says that that we have the right to dissent and the right to protest and all that other stuff in the Constitution. But it's a document that was written by enslavers and friends of enslavers to define the legal and political framework for a society whose economic foundation was slavery. It's not a it's an outmoded, backwards looking document to make a better world. We need to get beyond America. And just seeing the images of, say, the Border Patrol whipping Haitians, it's like, that's that's this country. That's, you know, it, it's not evolved in the past 240 years. It's been consistent. And people need to give up the dream that we can somehow make this work. For me... Yeah, go ahead, Ray. Go ahead. For me, for me, I mean, I could sit here. I mean, you, we don't have enough show to talk about why... <laughs> <laughs> why the flag ends up in my imagery. But I'll say this. Um, what to the slave is the 4th of July? Mm. Frederick Douglass. And I think there's a, there's a, there's, there's a quote that I, I, a quote from that passage that, I, that, that stays in my head. Um, I'm going to read it in a second. It, 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 it carries the work. I mean, it sits on the work. Um, for instance, I mean, I, I photographed this flag when we were all looking at Kaepernick's stance. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things, as a, as, a, as a storyteller, you'll always find words, words. It has a very strong narrative or the, it's driven by words. Mm -hmm. And no standing is, was, was so huge for me during, during using this flag as something that's turned backwards. Um, but back, back to the quote, I walk around and I see a lot of our people, and I say our people, I'm talking about black folk, um, talking to themselves, watched, and I like to use the word watched because that's what the others do. They watch us indifferently as you can tell that we're mentally ill. You can tell that what we're, what, what we're doing, because I, 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 I put myself a part of the, the, the group of people that have no clothes, smell, smell bad when they come on the, the subway, um, beg, are beggars on the street, sit on the, the, the corners, lie down and sleep on the, on, on the subway. And there's a, there's a quote, there's a little passage here that says, oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grief, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there was always the remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. England ran here to become America. It was a startling idea, much more so than we at this distance of time regarded it. The timid and the prudent has, uh, as has been intimidate, intimidated and that day, were of course shocked and alarmed by it. Oppressed men became mad. This flag, this flag for me, is the birth of oppression. And every time I see it, I look outside, look on the street, look on the subway, and I see what it has done to wise men, what it has done to people that look like me. But you also reach for your camera, right? And and you and you transform what it means through your art. And this, this and I say this because I wanted to make sure that we get a chance because I wanted to ask both of you this, um, which is how you think about the political efficacy of art 
and how it and and how art how art is in bo in both way, in some ways I would say has more potential than it's ever had before in part because there are means of kind of getting of transmitting ideas and artworks um, you know more easily and and, and, to, and quicker and to larger audiences in some ways than ever before but also I mean Ruddy you were talking earlier about some of the ways in which um, many aspects of protest itself and po and political protest have been commercialized have been co-opted have been institutionalized um, and I think many people would say the same is true of the art world itself um, that in many respects uh, uh, art or what passes under the name of official art uh, is very much co-opted in terms of its politics and institutionalized um, and both of both of you though it seems to me, have, have tried in different ways, although I think with echoes and similarities, to try and figure out how to keep, uh, uh, how to keep your art having an edge, uh, some, some kind of provocation, something that resists that total uh, 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 folding of it back into something safe. And so I, I sort of wanted to ask how you, how you think about that in the present context, where we're at in 2021, we've just gone through this, we're still going through this horrific, pandemic, uh, we've gone through the recent years in our politics. Um, how do you see sort of the state of art and, and what are the strategies that artists need to think about and keep in mind as we try and navigate this, this dialectic? Uh, I mean, Dred, you, you, you found uh, on repeated occasions, it seems to me, ways to stage our uh, works that have had a kind of explosive transgressive effect. They've managed to sort of break the breakthrough in some kind of important way. Uh, do you feel that, do you still grapple with this now? Do you feel like you still have to figure out uh, new strategies? Do you, do you worry about sort of the forces of co-optation continuously sort of pressing in on your art making? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it, it's, I mean, the, the, the key thing is having the art have have the edge that doesn't necessarily mean that it will have the social impact but if the art doesn't have the edge looking at important questions that are confronting humanity from a radical standpoint then it doesn't matter in a certain sense if it's really popular um, mm -hmm. or you know part of a conversation but if it does have some bite some tooth and gets people to reassess some key questions and hopefully stand with the oppressed and stand and, and look towards radical change Mm -hmm. then you've got a shot. But I think that the, the thing that's funny is as I've gotten older, and in part because of the, the broader change in society where there's, um, I mean, you know, we're supposedly going through a racial reckoning, which I mean, I, I think that there's been tremendous, beautiful rebellion, say, in response to the murder of, of George Floyd and, and uh, Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. I mean, seeing people all over the country, including a lot of white folk in towns that probably had never seen a black person saying Black Lives Matter. This is really good. But because of that, there's been renewed interest in my work. And, and so work like we had up on the, 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 you know, we had, well, that, but also is really thinking of a man was lynched by police yesterday, the banner that references the NAA, that one, yeah, that re it references the banner that the NAACP used to fly out in front of its national headquarters in the 20s and 30s, the day after anybody was lynched as part of an anti-lynching campaign. This work, you know, became sort of a meme in a certain sense and was, you know, both printed in the New York Times on the front page of the, of the, uh, the website, but also, you know, it, it became in vogue. There were, were people that were tweeting and retweeting and gramming and regramming it and drawing real important connections, which I think is, is great. But the, the, the thing that's, and so there's this focus on me, which is really fantastic, but it, there is a way in which the art world tends to kind of absorb s some of the critique and then then just say like, okay, we're all progressive and, and you know, and it was weird. So, so it's like, you know, s s some museums were putting like when, when the protests were happening around George Floyd, museums were putting up all their Black Lives Matter statements and some of them were putting up this artwork, which mm -hmm. there was a positive side to it. But then it's like, but what is the policies of the museum? What, mm -hmm. what is their, you know, I mean, are, are they showing work like this or are they not show, or they have a long history of suppressing work like this? 
And is that because the curatorial staff is, you know, formalist and old and white, or is it, are they changing with the times or are there boards like that? And so, but the big thing is what, what, you know, does the work have an edge? And I, I think that, that, you know, sometimes, I mean, I, I get censored all the time. I mean, I've got two billboards that are censored right now. And so that shows me that at least some powerful people don't want my message to connect with, with other people. And so that, you know, is, is a good sign, but there, it is a real struggle that when you, you know, when you get more spread in this, in a, a society that's based on oppression, there's a way in which that can just be, you know, sort of absorbed. And I, and I, I do wrestle with it, but the, the, you know, bigger thing is, is there going to be a broader movement for fundamental social change? And if the art is just existing off in its own realm and there is no movement of millions of people, then all the good art in the world is at best going to be, you know, entertainment for enlightened people as opposed to something that can really change the world or be part of changing the world. Like there were in the past with various movements where you have say, you know, a Picasso's Guernica in the midst of an anti-fascist movement where you have, uh, you know, uh, work by um, um, uh, you know, Diego Rivera in the midst of sort of, you know, people all across the world fighting for communism where you have Jimi Hendrix doing the Star Spangled Banner and shredding it at Woodstock in, in the midst of a, an anti-war movement. And so that's what's really needed. There needs to be this movement and the art can be part of the, the anthems and songs and imagery that connects with that. Ready, so do you want to jump in? This, this, the, 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 this is the part where, you know, I either like press the emergency brick <laughs> and come up. No, no, like, like everything, everything that Dredd just said, I mean, I, there, there are parts of it that I'm like, perfect. He's saying exactly where I am. And the other part is not that I, I do or don't agree. It's just that that's not where I am. Like mm -hmm. where I am, I'll stick to the art has become entertainment. Mm -hmm. Like, like, and it doesn't matter how edgy, because Dredd and I are not making the edgiest of work. We are standing on people's backs who have made edgy work in, in the past. And it hasn't changed. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Dredd and I are still still pushing the screw drive, the screw into the, the board because it hasn't changed. So yes, what do we need to do to, 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 to create mm -hmm. To create stimulus, to create pol political change, to create um, social awareness, to create um, a, a, a movement that does not just look at art as okay, that is something that people are doing to do this change over here. Let it just stay there. Where is where is the why that we're doing it? Where mm -hmm. is the the thing that allows everybody to be galvanized or move against the thing that we're, we're speaking against. I mean, I, I'm yet to see um, colleagues of mine on Instagram, I'm talking about white colleagues of mine, pick up their phone and talk about police brutality the same way Dredd and I are talking about police lynching and police brutality. And Dredd used the word progressive. Yes, whenever, whenever there's, a, there's a movement and, mm. and, and progressives or liberals press repost or press, they believe that that is their contribution, that they have contributed to the movement of art. And that, that, it, 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 that's the part of me that goes, why am I doing this? Mm. Because, because all I feel like I'm doing is, you know when, you, know, when you, you, you turn the screw in the wood and you hear the, ah, 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 and it's not going anywhere, that's how it feels. It feels yeah. like, I feel like it's not it's not changing anything. Yeah, we still red, I, by the way we're still redlining. No, we're no, no, redlining. You know, we're still. I mean, I, I I was in Fort Greene only three years ago, right before the pandemic, where two businessmen came to the school to laugh. One black, one white. The black one said, "I just brought my wife in to let you know that this still the thing still exists." 
I asked for a business loan. I did not get it. I asked my friend who does not need it to go get the, ask for the business loan. He got the business loan. And all he did was to tell the person, the, the, the clerk, I don't need it. I just wanted to make sure that my friend came here for the same loan yesterday and he didn't give it to him. That thing, we, it, and that's three years ago. So where's, how is my art, edgy or not, changing anything? I just feel like it becomes more about ego. It becomes more about, about the space, what art has always represented, which was, it is by in itself entertainment. It is a movement that brings people in to ogle and to lift people up through their egos. It's a, I, you know, <laughs> I hear what you're saying, right? And this is the thing. I mean, you know, I, I, I think I feel like I debate this with myself all the time. But I guess what I, I, I what I would say though, to point like it's not to contradict it, to, but to put it alongside that, because I think you're speaking your truth right now. Um, but I think it's a question that we all face, um, and it reminds me um, to bring another uh, 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 artwork associated with um, with New York City. Um, it reminds me of uh, something which I wrote about actually in my in my essay collection, which is um, I wrote a little bit about Kara Walker's um, a subtlety, the sugar baby, you know, which she made out of sugar in the um, Domino, the old Domino factory there. And you know, one of the things I was grappling with was just some of the things that you're talking about. That is to say, the ways in which, on the one hand, you know, that art artwork generated a certain kind, it created a certain kind of spectacle, a certain kind of show, and it provided a certain kind of entertainment. It may, in various ways, have actually contributed to a certain kind of uh, projects of gentrification of that neighborhood. There's all kinds of ways, right, in the art market and its valuation and all these complicated things um, that, that kind of go into it. And at the same time, my feeling that, you know, she, she made an extraordinary work of art. I really believe that. Like, I believe it's, it's, it's just extreme. It, I think it's the very fact that it, somebody was able to make it, that it actually happened, that it actually took up the space that it did at a, at a moment in history at a particular time and stood there. To me, it's, it's this quality almost of a kind of witnessing. And, and I'm tempted to say that maybe, yes, even if there's zero political efficacy from your photographs, Roddy Roy, or Dred Scott from your um, interventions and performances and artworks and all the, you know, the constant work that you're putting out, the reenactments, even if nothing came from it, I still, in terms of a kind of concrete political victory, to me, something about the fact that in kind of almost like the ledger book of history, it, it happened, it was there, there was a kind of witnessing that took place still is still powerful it's still meaningful i'm not sure if that that's enough of a consolation but i, but you, I think you, about that side of it what you're talking about is a debate that rebecca and i have in art versus artifact hmm. um and i'm gonna mess up this word Historic, historicity sure what what is art and what lends itself to becoming history that's one two which is really important is if it if we do not do the art to create ripples, why do we do it? And the only other answer is ego. The only other answer. I agree. But like speaking, it, it needs no, it, it needs one percent at, no, at least zero point something some some percent of political. So the only I'm I'm not, I'm not gonna leave it here. The yeah. only the only consolation I get from this is the fact that I'm doing the art for somebody a hundred years from now. Because I, I, I agree with that. I feel because that I feel, this, this feel year cool. is not is not ready for it. And that's if you had said that to me, if you had said maybe what it is then is while we're not ready for what this is, when we do it a hundred years from now, there's that little girl, a little dude who's waiting, mm -hmm. waiting for us to be done so that they can take it up and go, I've been waiting for this. Mm -hmm. That's where my consolation comes from. The thing is, Ruddy, I mean, that there's some truth to that, but there's also, you don't know when you do something, how it's, wh where it's going to go, what it's going to become. The people that were the freedom riders didn't necessarily know that they were going to be a pivotal moment in the civil rights movement. They could have just been some kids who got on buses and got their skulls cracked and people could have said, all right, I told you we couldn't end Jim Crow. And that could have been it. When, you know, it's, you know, there, there are artworks that get, you know, when, when 
artworks did, they become kind of pivotal pardon Jim, Jim Crow is here it's a new form though it is a new form there's a new Jim Crow that is terrible the, that people are often blind to but it, it, they're at legalized discrimination except in terms of I get it I get it I get prison it prison has been yeah, yeah. Eliminated, and I, I mean, I, I think the big, the big thing we're paying for is that we haven't had a revolution, and this, this, you know, monster of a country is still oppressing people all over the world. Got it. But, but there have been changes at at certain times that have, you know, I mean, Absolutely. you know, the Civil War did change something. I mean, it's like, yes, you still have brutal oppression of black people, but it's better to be, you know. Uh, rented out as opposed to outright owned in a certain right. sense. We, you know, I'd rather be a wage slave than chattel slave. Yeah. And, and so I do think there have been changes, even though there's, we still live in an oppressive society that is rotten to its core. But I think the question with the art is you don't know when you're gonna make something or a political movement, you don't know what, when you do something, whether it is actually gonna be part of the spark. Colin Kaepernick probably didn't know that right. he would be, as important and influential as he was. I, he knew he was standing on the right side of history, that he was a righteous brother, but I don't think that he knew that today we'd be having all sorts of conversation, that you'd be making art that would be in, influenced and inspired by him, that would be on Nike billboards, you know, and, all, and I mean, Nike billboards, not just selling shoes, but actually selling consciousness in a certain sense. And so, you know, I think we don't know. And, I, and so you have to make the work, yes, with the notion that in a hundred years, somebody might see that there were people that were fighting, resisting thinking, but that you also might make the work that becomes part of a broader movement for change. Speaking of those ripples, revolution. I have to, I have to only uh, cut in because I, I need to uh, try and open it up to the Q and A because I, I think there, I know there are people that came, that, you know, wanted to to meet you guys and, and and ask you guys questions, and I've hogged all the time because I really wanted to to talk to you. But uh, maybe we can uh, get to the Q and A. Where do we have questions here? Um, let me see. All right, from anonymous. Thank thank you both for your work in this conversations. Uh, the pathologies of whiteness and capitalism and historical amnesia are eating us alive. Do you believe that used strategically the withdrawal or refusal to depict could ever be an artistic act of resistance? That's an interesting question. Refusal, sort of a, a, a kind of negation, uh, I suppose they're asking is the question, rather than putting something out into the world. Do you guys want to tackle that one? Well, I think, I think Dre just, I mean, what he just said kind of answered the question, which is you put it all because you have no idea how it's going to influence somebody's thinking and, and what else can come off or can be produced from the idea of or the idea of doing anything so in a way in a way Dred just answered that question i think mm -hmm. and i also think artists are forever inventive and they are i think there could be ways that people's refusal could actually be really powerful i don't i don't necessarily know all of how that could happen. I mean, I do know actually in a, from a slightly different angle, actually coming back a little bit to some of what Ruddy was saying earlier about who you represent, but like Kerry James Marshall says, I'm not painting white folk. And that's a refusal to paint. And you know, he's a master painter. He's you know, one of the best painters of the, the late 20th, early 21st century. And he's like, look, there are enough paintings of white people. I'm painting black folk. And so, you know, that is a certain refusal to say, I'm a master of my craft. I could paint anything I want. But there's enough, you know, there's enough paintings of Elvis, you know, we got to have some, some other paintings out there. So, but I mean, I think there are other kinds of refusal, but I don't, I don't know what they are. I mean, you know, but I'm, I'm sure, yeah, that could be an important strategy. Art has to be intentional. I mean, like, oh, and so if refusing is an, in, has the, its intent, um, then it will, it will produce um, the demand response. Hmm. Yeah, we're uh, we're almost at time, and so uh, I want to I wanted to uh, put it to you guys. Uh, well, first of all, to thank both of you for this I think extraordinary conversation. I thought this was exactly the kind of thing I wanted to kind of kick us off with um, in the kind of maelstrom with all the hardest questions <laughs> on the table, and it's going to be interesting to see you know because we're 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 going to be iterating this through different 
media essentially you know talking to folks who are, who are writers more uh talking to people who are in who are in the world of music um and it'll be interesting to see i, I suspect we'll hear in many ways actually a lot of kind of echoes to some of the similar questions and and dynamics um that you all are are, are wrestling with and grappling with um but uh uh dread and ready any last thoughts or statements i wanted to leave the mic for you before we before we have to cut it out I'll, I'll give Dredd the, the, the seat for the final comment. Um, picture um, the, the picture of the kid in Minneapolis with the shirt, the t-shirt. Um, I didn't go there to make art. I mean, they can put it up quickly, yeah. I went there to, to do a story and as I was, I, it was the hardest thing to get into the community. It was tough to get into the community. Mm. And I remember seeing this kid with the shirt, Minneapolis five, oh my God, I'm gonna forget now. 5320, or 53205 is the worst zip code in America. Hmm. 53205. And that's where he, he lived. And I turned around and I saw he lived in the worst zip code in America. And his t-shirt says, home of the brave. I also listened to my ancestors. So I thought this was one of those offerings. Hmm. That mm -hmm. I was getting. I photographed this image, went to the, the mall, printed a t shirt with it on it, and put 53205 matters under the bottom of this t shirt. And I wore it the next day in this community. By the end of the day, I saw a group of people coming towards me. And you know, when you have that feeling like they're coming for you, like the mob, their yes. eyes were just fixed on you. So I started to back up against a wall and I was like, whatever they're gonna do, I'm ready. Like I'm bracing for it. And a mom comes out of the crowd and she goes, everybody in this community is telling me that you're wearing this t-shirt. And I'm like, uh, yeah. She goes, and you're from New York, right? I'm like, yeah. She goes, you're telling me that, you, are you a person from New York? Come all the way to Milwaukee. I think it's Milwaukee. And that's the t-shirt you made. And she just started to cry. And she was like, it's so good to know that outsiders are telling us that where we live matters. And it's as simple as that for me. Like telling, telling the story of everyday people is, it is simple. Being included is simple. Mm -hmm. And so for me, when living is a protest is born out of this idea that everybody's voice should be counted. Beautiful. Thank you. Dred, you want to carry um, a little bit, I guess. I mean, first, I just want to say thank you to, to Jesse and, and to the Brooklyn Book Library. I mean, this was a great conversation and it was really a pleasure actually being able to hear Ruddy talk about some of his work and, and to Word. share the stage with, I mean, this this has been a really invigorating conversation, I thought. And, and I'll just say that, you know, it's like we're living in very precarious times that I think there's very powerful forces both in this country and around the world that are trying to drag the, the people and the planet back to hell. I mean, and literally the planet is on fire and people are trying to add gasoline. And yet there are other brave people that are trying to wrench a different future out of it. And so I, I hope that my work contributes to, to the, the, the people who are fighting to, to end oppression in both is inspiring and, you know, it's like I tell people that Joe Strummer saved my life. I mean, Joe Strummer was the lead guitarist for The Clash, or uh, sort of a rebel band from England in the, the 70s and 80s. I never met him, but just having somebody talk about sort of, you know, fighting the power in a certain sense um, made me think that I was sane and that the, the people who were running the world were crazy, the crazy ones. And so, you know, I think that there's a world to change, whether you're an artist or a, a student or a lawyer or a doctor or a, you know, somebody who just you know, works at home or something, whatever, there's a world that needs to change and this either it's gonna get radically worse for a long time or it could get radically better and we all have a role to play and we need to decide. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, you guys, for joining me, um, for kicking off uh, you know, our series. Um, Folks, if you're out there, you know I I, I hope you'll 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 check out um, both of these artists' works. Um, you know you can find them in all the usual places. I think online and uh, we mentioned the Instagram account and so on and so forth. 
Um, thank you, gentlemen, both for your work. Um, thank you for joining me in conversation. Um, and Marsha, if you're you're out there, I'll uh, I'll hand it um, over to you. And thank you for um, and to the society for for hosting us and for allowing us to have this this important conversation. Uh, you know, and thank thank you doesn't really do justice um, to this conversation, but I'm going to have to leave it at thank you because I don't have any other words. Um, it really was extraordinary to listen to you all speaking to each other, and I want to uh, make sure everyone knows that we've recorded this, we're posting it in our YouTube um, page. It's the kind of thing I could listen to a few times, I think. And the series does continue in November, as Jesse says, in November, we will be talking about music with Jamila Woods and Jason King. In December, we will look at Written Word with Morgan Jerkins and Joshua Bennett. Um, so I hope that you will all join us for those. Um, thank you again to NYU's 370J project and thank you to everybody who came to listen tonight. I hope you all have um, a great rest of your evening. Yeah. Thank, thank you to everyone out there.